Okay, and here's this labor force participation number. So this number, is, it's pretty volatile. People move in and out of the labor force. Um, and you can see that it's, um, well, for New Jer Jersey, it's actually, it's gotten, it's gotten up to a, a higher level, but it's still well below where it was for most of this period. So it's, it's caught up to its pre-pandemic level, the red line, but it is not where it was for much, much of the period um, here. And so that's part of the explanation. You know, the, the population of New Jersey is aging, there's just fewer workers. Uh, immigration has been an issue. Like, there was a big reduction in immigration for a time related to the pandemic and other policies. And so that's led to a reduction in the um, size of the workforce. That's part of the issue here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, housing. So this is a measure called the Zillow Observed Rent Index. It's, um, it's a measure of new rents um, on, on new apartment leases. Um, and so it's, it's, it's good because it's sort of up to date what's happening in the market. It's actually complicated because leases can last for a few months and, or for a few years. And it's like if you just look at what the price of renting is right now, you got to account for the fact that the new ones might be higher than the, than the, than the existing ones. So that's what, that's what this thing corrects for, this observed rent index. Um, and you can see a couple things here. First of all, rents are way up across the country since the beginning of the pandemic. Like for, for the U.S., they're up nearly 30% since the beginning of the pandemic. That's a big number. Um, and they're up in most parts of our region just about that much or even more. Upstate, New York, northern New Jersey. Um, but New York City has underperformed. That is, rents have not grown very much in New York City. This is, again, this sort of manifestation of people sort of moving out of the, the big cities. And you'll see this in the office market as well, you know, home ownership um, as well. So there's a real collapse in rents actually early during the pandemic in New York City. It's recovered somewhat, but still well below where the U.S. is as a whole. Here's um, the, the pieces of New York City, and that was especially true in Manhattan, the most central part, um, but also true in Brooklyn and Queens. We saw this sort of collapse and then a slow rebound since then. Yeah. Is this residential rents? These are residential rents, yes. Did you have a question too? Yeah, well, rent control probably affects these. I mean, they can't go up that much. Um, that's right. But, but that, I don't think that can explain the big decline in, uh, in rents. But you're right. There, there is a fa that is a factor there. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Oh, to, to finance. That's a question I don't know the answer to. That sounds like an interesting research question. I mean, it's certainly been the case that there's been a lot more stress in, in the rental markets, and um, evictions have come back and gone up. Um, we've written a little bit about that. But I don't, I'm not familiar with this form of credit. It's, a, it's to borrow to be able to pay your rent or to make the down payment? I see. Okay. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's. That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, now that, so do you, does New York have the same kind of backlog of evictions that New Jersey does with the transition mortgage? Is that maybe a little bit of reason? Like, there's more that people call those new places to really help them? Yes, I think that probably is part of the part of the issue in New York City. That and that, you know, there's various manifestations of that throughout the housing market. The one I think about the most is this, the reduction in foreclosures. Which you know, a lot of people just stopped paying their mortgages. They didn't get, they didn't have, they didn't have to pay. They got forbearance, and so you know, some of those people would have gotten foreclosed on, in prior, and that would have put actually turns out like a couple million units on the on the market. So that was actually quite a f significant part of, I believe, the run up in house prices. It like really constrained supply, and I think the same thing's probably going on in the rental market. Okay. Um, where was I? Yes, Brooklyn. Okay. So here are house values. Um, these, are, these are now um, um, sales of, generally speaking, owner-occupied housing units. Um, and again, you can see, as most of us know, house prices really skyrocketed in the early part of the pandemic. They were up 40% um, in the first two years of the pandemic, which is really just staggering um, in the U.S. as a whole. Then they leveled out as the Fed raised interest rates. But they started to grow again, although not, not at the pace at which they were growing prior. 
And that basic pattern is true, although it's more muted in most parts of our region. Um, what is, where it's not true is New York City, once again, where growth in house prices have been very, very weak over the last, um, over the last whatever, four years now. And in particular, Manhattan um, has had quite low growth over the last couple of years. So, and in fact, big, big declines in house prices over the last couple of years. Now, when you're thinking about Manhattan and New York City as a whole, really the rental market is, of course, two thirds of the market for, for where people live. So this is a little bit less relevant. Um, but nonetheless, it's sort of an indicator of how, how much demand, how much the spatial patterns of demand for where to live have changed over the course of the pandemic. And we sort of have, a, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting thing to, to be watching as we go forward. Like, is it going to go back to where we were or is it going to start to um, be a permanent change in where we live and work? Mercer County here um, in purple um, has done even better than the nation as a whole and do, done better than, the, um, than most of the other parts of New Jersey. Well, Monmouth, again, also quite strong. So these more outlying areas like Monmouth, Mercer, um, further away have done, have done quite well during the pandemic. Okay, so here's a, a chart on office vacancies. And um, this, this is, again, a manifestation of this sort of change in the way we live and work. Here, the two lines at the bottom are the two major markets in New York City, downtown Manhattan and midtown Manhattan. And you can see that historically they've had really pretty low, um, relative to the rest of the region at least, uh, really low vacancy rates, you know, hovering around 10% leading into the pandemic. And then New Central and Northern Jersey had considerably higher vacancy rates, as you know, those of us who live in central Jersey know, it's come down a little bit over the course of the pre-pandemic period, but not that much. Um, and it's been um, you know, pretty flat over that period at a high level. So what's happened during the pandemic? Well, New York City offices still not back to you know, where they had been before, and there's much more vacancy. This doesn't capture sort of subleases and all kinds of other ways of, that are sort of you know, what you should call shadow vacancies. Um, but these, um, these actually um, reflect just the, just the sort of actual vacancy rates. And you can see that it skyrocketed during the pandemic and there's really no sign of it coming back down. Um, it's now caught up to the, cent the central and North Jersey numbers. Um, so in a way, it's, it's a sort of a leveling of the playing field you know, over space as opposed to you know, is this huge tilt toward the suburbs. But it is, in fact, um, a big change over time. So that's an important indicator of what's, what's been happening in the work from home and world. Final thing, I think we ask our um, survey respondents what they expect in the future. And um, this is a measure, this shows that. So as of December, um, we asked them, you know, what do you think conditions will be like six months from now compared to um, what they normally are six months from now in that time of year? And um, Again, the diffusion index, the way I just find it before, sort of the positives mean things are improving, the negatives that mean that they're getting worse. Um, you can see that the, there's been a slight, if you look closely, maybe squint a little bit, uh, some sense that things are improving a little bit, that we're going to be a little bit better off six months from now than we are now. Um, there was a, you know, in the early part of the Fed's interest rate rising campaign, businesses knew this is not going to be great, and they saw they, these numbers went negative. Now they're a little more positive. It looks like businesses, at least in the, our survey, are showing some optimism for the future. So that's a good sign. OK, so um, the region has slowed over the last 18 months. Um, it is on, since, since 2020, really since the pandemic, New Jersey's been on pretty close pace with the United States as a whole um, in, in terms of job growth and many other indicators. And central New Jersey, I'd say, is a little bit ahead of the rest of the nation in terms of like housing growth and employment growth, so that's a good sign. Um, housing prices have been very, very strong. Offices, office market, not so much. It didn't, it's not like all those um, vacancies that appeared in New York City resulted in filled space in the suburbs. There's no sign of that. It's just that there's no more people working in those offices anywhere. They're working at home. So that's a big change and something that we'll have to see how it goes. Okay. So that's all I have. Um, I have could answer a couple of questions. We out of time? Or? Okay. All right. Um, and the, you know, the most everything that I presented here came from that website. So uh, one way or another. So you feel free to um, go there and browse around, ask a question.
Okay, question. Yeah. Ah, that's a good question. So I don't know the specifics of Philadelphia other than going there occasionally, but the people I talk to in New York, and this is, this is not data, this is sort of anecdata, as they say, anecdote, um, but people who are in a position to know, say that New York's actually doing much better than a lot of other cities. Um, compared to um, San Francisco, Chicago, um, the, the places that New York City really sees itself com competing with, uh, the people in New York think it's doing quite well, um, that it's actually rebounding more, or the, the decline has been slower in New York or less in New York. Philadelphia, I'm not so sure about, although I think um, that there have been some significant challenges in Philadelphia, as I understand. Yeah. What do you see in terms of rating the 24? <laughs> well, of course, that is not something that I uh, would be able to opine upon, um, and I don't really know. Um, if you really want to see what the range of opinions on that is, I would suggest you look at the Survey of Economic Projections. You ever hear of that thing? So that's the members of the Federal Open Market Committee. They're the rate setting group for the Federal Reserve. Uh, put out every um, two meetings, four times a year, uh, their projections for what um, the economy is going to do, and in particular, in this case, what interest rates will be at different points in time. So you can see that there's a, an estimate of what interest rates will be a year from December, essentially, when the last they last did this. Um, and those projections show that the, most of the members expect interest rates to be lower than they are today. You, the details, I, I'll blow the details if I try to give them to you, so I won't do that. Um, yeah, I think you're next. I, I have a very long answer to that question. I'll try to give you the shorter answer to it. Um, so here's one thing we have. This is called the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, which we developed in the, during the pandemic in response to making the mistake that you're describing um, as part of the response. And what it shows is that um, supply chain pressures really, really went up a lot during the pandemic. And so that's a supply side factor that drives prices up. Um, so now we monitor this on a monthly basis. And you can see they fell down. Actually, they were below normal. They were actually looser. Supply chain conditions were actually looser than normal in the s previous, like, several months. But they're starting to go up again. It's starting to tighten again. And that's because of the Red Sea and the whole. Um, so, so that's something we're going to really watch and be careful of. Um, we also have this new thing called the multivariate core trend um, analysis of inflation. And what we do is we take all the various pieces of the, of the deflator, the part that's got to do with shelter, the part that's got to do with food, the part that's got to do with transportation, and, and see how those are moving relative to their pre-existing trends and how they will feed into current and future inflation. And so we monitor that quite carefully. And in fact, that actually is more optimistic than the headline numbers that I showed during the main part of the talk. That's what this is. This is all on our website, so you could see any of this that you like. So will we be perfect at getting it right? No way. We won't. Um, and we did make a mistake. We were, we were blasé about the, uh, the stickiness of this inflationary bout, um, for sure. But I, you know, have we learned our lesson? We've certainly learned part of it. OK, yeah. I have a question on the uh, Fed using inflation rate I mean, after the subprime for 10 years as a measure distortions in the investor market and a hunt for investments that would be the equivalent of the old fixed income market. Is that structural concern? Is there a concern on the part of the Fed that returning to that there's something in addition to the 2% inflation rate that they need to be looking at in terms of the federal funds rate? So 
there's three parts to our mandate, really. Um, stable prices, by which we take it to be 2%, so that's what you're asking about. Um, maximum sustainable employment and financial stability. It's the third piece, and we have, a, we have a big apparatus that's targeted to thinking about financial stability. There's a, there's a um, quarterly financial stability report that we put out that monitors all different aspects of the financial system for signs of instability. Um, so yes, now how do you address instability in the financial sector? Probably not with the Fed funds rate. That's the tricky part. We have to use other tools in addition to the Fed funds rate to get at um, financial stability concerns and to make sure that the instruments that are being used are not dangerous to the financial system. You know, there's a whole rise of non-bank financial institutions. How do we manage that in the context of our, um, our limited purview into the financial system? So there's a lot of challenges there. But yes, we do certainly think beyond the exact relationship between the Fed funds rate and financial, I'm sorry, um, the inflation rate when thinking about the implications of, of monetary policy changes. Okay, thanks everyone, great questions. <laughs>